Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome after a nice long break to a Breakfast Club episode. We think it's 48. We're not entirely sure. Um, but what we are sure about is that we are really lucky today to welcome back um, really our first kind of our proto Breakfast Club guest, Dr. Shannon Bennett, a virologist and chief of science at the Academy of Sciences. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Laurel. <laughs> so nice to be here. Yeah, and you were on really um, before we actually called it Breakfast Club, but we pulled you in on the very day the Academy first closed back in March. I think it was March 12th. Um, so it feels so long ago. It really does. And it really was. Um, when And it's it's kind of, it's always kind of shocking to think how much time has passed in this kind of slow molasses-like way. Um, yeah. But one thing that's not, that's like totally you can't question is that the space um, has not gotten less complicated um, oh, or less no. crazy um, and has not really stopped developing. So um, so glad that you're here today to kind of walk us through the latest and what we know and are facing at this point. Um, and can you actually yeah. tell us what you will be kind of talking about in the first half hour? Sure. So back in March, I, I was uh, very focused as all the world was focused on sort of the dynamics of the, of the numbers, how the how the virus uh, was spreading through the world and in different countries and and how different countries were taking approaches to flattening the curve. And naively, I think, well, I certainly was really uh, watching for that characteristic bend in the curve right. when we would sort of see the denouement of this virus and all of our hard work in uh, controlling our social interactions were going to pay off. Today, I'm going to talk a lot more about our new emerging understanding, a new reality of how the spread has continued, how um, efforts to bend the curve have, have really varied by country, and, and ask the question, how much is the evolution of the virus itself underlying some of the, of the global patterns we're seeing? Okay. So we'll have some time. I, I want to keep the talk uh, short and have a lot of time for discussion, but I will be showing some family trees of this of the virus strains and, and maybe getting a little get, bit techy about what uh, defines them and what they mean for the vaccines that we uh, are currently hoping to get as soon as possible. Great. Okay, that sounds good. And yeah, as Shannon kind of alluded to, we are saving more time than usual for questions at the end. Um, a lot of you have sent questions in, in advance, so thank you to everybody who did that. But if you haven't, you are welcome to leave your questions for Shannon um, in either the Facebook comments, if you're watching there, or in the YouTube chat at any point. And after her initial presentation, I'll jump back in and we will move on to those. So Shannon, let me go ahead and give you your slides. And I will get out of here and see you at the end. Thank you so much again. Thank you. All right, so um, I really wanna talk about the evolution of this virus and with res respect explicitly to the vaccines and other tools that we're using uh, to, to combat it. So you may recall, probably lots of people have been uh, getting uh, diving deep into the SARS origins, uh, but it was first uh, identified last year. Actually, uh, the first cases were in December the, in China, uh, the first cases in the US, uh, in Washington in January. So we just passed our one year anniversary of uh, SARS-2 in the US. The first genomes were made public January 10th and they elucidated the, uh, the, the, the family tree of this virus and placed it in a context with uh, other known viruses, SARS-1, um, MERS, uh, and even some seasonal flu uh, sorry, seasonal cold-like viruses, the human coronaviruses in green. And importantly, it identified a close relative to SARS-2 in bats. So uh, what I wanted to point out here is that it's it's been incredibly important to have an open uh, data science framework to study this virus and to address it as a global community of scientists and public health care workers. And having that genome available on January 10th was the beginning of developing vaccines uh, that could combat this virus. So um, it, since emerging in China, this, this is a graphic that kind of shows how it's unfolded in a few countries. Uh, you, can, you can access uh, the, the same story in, in many different countries around the world. But I, I pulled uh, up the US, the United Kingdom, South Africa, but the, because they've been mentioned recently as origins of some new strains of concern or variants of concern. 
And I have China here for reference. So on the top, you have cumulative uh, cases. In orange are confirmed cases and in gray are uh, deaths by country. In uh, On the bottom panels, you have daily new cases. And this is the, the, the daily new graphics are what people refer to when they talk about bending or flattening the curve. What they really want to do is try to turn that peak around in daily new cases so that the daily new cases starts to drop over time and that, and that curve bends down to zero. And as you can see, uh, nobody, um, not even China, although it's doing better, is, is really flattening the curve. Uh, so here in the U.S., we are definitely seeing um, a surge in cases. There's a, almost 25 million uh, cases in the U.S. to date, and California is hot, hot, hot. Although you can see from this little graphic on the far left that that there's a little bit of hope in sight and we're starting to bend that curve of daily new cases. However, what I wanna talk about today is the uh, growing prevalence of some new strains that uh, appear to be more transmissible. And that might uh, reverse the gains that we have been seeing in this graphic of late. So, this is an RNA virus. So this is a family tree of all the viruses, um, sorry, a subset of the viruses. There's been um, hundreds of thousands of sequences and this is only a few thousand. And uh, it, it's basically showing the family tree of the virus since it originated in China. And those are on the far left at the bottom in blue. And then uh, as the virus has sort of emerged and spread through time and the bottom axis is date, you can see that the viruses are just, are, are proliferating, are, they're diversifying, they're accumulating differences relative the, to the first strains that emerged in China. And that's totally normal. Viruses evolve constantly, especially RNA viruses. They evolve faster than we do. Uh, they are um, changing all the time, but most of those changes are neutral. They're actually neutral markers of how the viruses might be related to each other. So it allows us to, uh, track virus uh, connections uh, between, say, countries or between patients in an outbreak. But some of the substitutions, these are mutations that might crop up and, and become fixed in the viruses, uh, might have meaning. And, and that's really the conversation that we're having today. How do you, first of all, identify a variant uh, that might be significant and then understand why it might be significant. And the why it might be significant is really, is it going to be more transmissible? Is it going to make us sicker? Is it more virulent? And will it be blocked by uh, the current vaccines that we have in hand? So um, this is a, 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 um, a very handy tool, another open source data tool and I'll just uh, acknowledge the contribution of many, many genome centers around the world that are, are contributing uh, sequences to this family tree of the SARS coronavirus 2 over time and georeference. So it's a really powerful tool. So um, early on in uh, this, this, this is a, 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 um, a variant of concern that cropped up in the spring. And if you go back to this tree, there's um, this this um, mutant virus uh, was really the the one that's referred to as as 20A. So it, it's something that's sort of diversified. But going back, it's actually this similar mutations have been found even sp spattered throughout Asia samples before uh, 20A emerged. So this lineage was the first uh, one that was really that hit the press by storm, and uh, was the first variant of concern where people wanted to ask the question, does this mutation have significance to um, the virus? And I just wanna get into a little bit of nomenclature because it gets a little bit confusing, but the SD614G, the S refers to the spike protein, the D refers to the original nature of the encoded amino acid, 614 is the position in the spike protein, and then G is the new or substituted amino acid. And so uh, fondly, people were calling this variant Douglas or uh, D614G, but it's just one mutation in a whole suite of mutations. And so um, on the far left, a graphic shows uh, that its first appearance in, in late January, 
or uh, February, and how it very quickly became a very dominant signature uh, around the world. In the middle is a graphic showing that this strain is actually, or variant, has many different mutations. It's not just six uh, uh, D614G, but that's the one of interest that people are really uh, trying to find out whether it has any significance. And it's the one that's actually buried in the middle of this image of the spike protein. And you can see it's denoted by this little uh, set of letters CD with the white box. <clears throat> So in addressing whether this is significant, uh, people wanted to ask, does it cause more infection in cells or in animals? And it turns out that it does, it's a little bit more infectious in cells, but it's a pretty subtle. It's the red bar, which is a little bit higher than the black bar. And then in the bottom panel, and I'm looking at the graphs on the right, it uh, also seems to be more infectious, but only in the upper respiratory tract. So you see a little bit more of a spread between the red spots and the black spots in the, navel lava in the nasal lavash and the trachea, and not so much in the lungs. So that suggests that it's, it, it, it could be that this uh, D614G uh, virus strain is, is more infectious, but it's probably pretty subtle. And we don't really know what it does, this specific mutation, because it's buried deep inside the spike protein. So it's not actually actively engaged in a receptor binding uh, position with the host cell receptor. But it turns out that this virus, uh, this virus variant, D614G, has given rise, has continued to evolve and spread worldwide and given rise to other variants of concern. So all of these new variants do have, also have uh, the D614G mutation and are um, related in some way to those original uh, 2020 clades. So um, these have all been in the news and I just wanna break it down for you why they're of concern and whether they're important. What, what's the significance to the tools that we have to fight this virus? So the first one is B117 and it, it was at first identified in the UK and it's pictured down here on the uh, far bottom left and it has many different mutations but the one that's being significantly watched is this N501Y, also in the spike protein. This is These are images of the spike protein. And you can see it's shown in amber that it's really um, nested in the part of the spike protein that binds to the human uh, ACE2 receptor. And that's the main cell receptor that the virus uses to bind to the host cell. Uh, another variant of concern, which has been emerging in South Africa of uh, recently, is the B uh, one, three, five, one. And that has several mutations. Uh, it has a five, uh, an N501Y that independently arose. So this virus is in a separate uh, lineage and ha uh, experienced uh, evolution of 501Y as well uh, in, through a different uh, a root. It also has other mutations clustered around the binding site, the receptor binding domain that interacts with H2. And the one of note is E484K. So the big question that everybody wants to know is, are these mutations going to impact uh, the vaccines? And so on the far right is a graphic, and I apologize that it's so uh, uh, data heavy, and uh, all, for all these graphs, but I have included the links and if you, and this will be recorded. So if you wanna go back and follow these um, actual papers and dive in, I, I invite you to. And I will just say that on the top, you have um, a, a, a paper that took uh, many, many people that uh, had had SARS-CoV-2 and looked at their sera, their, their blood, and looked at the, the the many antibodies that we may have that that um are uh, that we produce as the result of a natural infection, and then asked whether specific mutations in the spike protein were still neutralized by those mutations, and the ones that are in 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 dark uh, blue and are near the the top are the ones that actually can escape 
our, our neutralization toolkit based on a natural infection. So it's not so that, and this is what the vaccines are trying to um, induce. And so these would be mutations of interest. And I'll just draw your attention to 484, which is a, a major variant, a mutation in the B135 South African variant. And then a new mutation that we're watching that's arisen here in California. And that's uh, buried in the middle of the graph in a light blue, and it's 452. And you can see many of these mutations, especially the ones shown in a very, very dark red color, are the ones that are most likely uh, to escape an immune response where there's a mutation present. And there's um, and uh, 484 and 452 are both uh, featured here. So I just wanna go back to B117. It's been in the news a lot. Uh, the UK first identified it in September, 2020, and it very quickly became uh, the dominant strain. And so this graphic on the uh, left shows that more and more healthcare centers started to report the presence of this variant of concern, VOC, and that the proportion of um, samples that were sequenced that were the variant of concern uh, became increasingly uh, high, uh, up, upwards of 80%. And so uh, that this variant clearly took over very quickly. And remember, it has one key mutation, the N501Y, which actually doesn't really uh, seem to impact immunity. However, this virus is probably more transmissible. And we think that's the case because it took over so quickly, it became dominant so quickly in about six to eight weeks. And it's also really interesting in terms of its evolutionary origins. So on the right, you have two um, lines. The first line, the lower line, is the evolutionary rate of the uh, wild type viruses, the ones circulating sort of the D614G before this variant emerged. And then in the upper cloud, you have the new lineage B117. And what's really significant is that it, within this lineage, viruses are still evolving at the same clock-like rate as wild type. But it made a huge leap in terms of accruing many, many mutations. I think the count was 23 new mutations all in one jump. And so this is a, a, an important conversation around where this virus came from. The hypothesis is that it maybe came from within a human host, evolution within that human host that was either immune, immune compromised or had been treated uh, with an antibody treatment that selected for escaped uh, viruses or resistant viruses. So TBD, um, and we're watching that. So I just wanted to really quickly summarize. There are many variants of concern, and that just means we're watching. And many of them need follow-up study to understand whether they're more transmissible, uh, whether they may uh, the mutations that they uh, have, any one of them might um, lend it, uh, the the variant to be an immune escapee, either from natural immunity or vaccine-induced immunity. And so the CDC is currently redefining what they would call a variant of concern and how we can take a global approach to monitoring the trajectory of spread of variants of concern, as well as how we might um, design follow-up studies to really understand their significance or impact. So this table just quickly lists some of the variants of concern. The labeling is very confusing. Some people label them by lineage. The variant is often maybe labeled by the mutation of interest, but they have many, many other mutations. And so I, I've already mentioned 614G, and I've mentioned uh, B117 and B351. There's also the, the um, emergence of that strain in a, in a mink population in the Netherlands and in Denmark. Um, and then uh, there's another strain emerging from Brazil. And importantly, we have a new strain right here in our own backyard um, called L452R, which I had mentioned before is mildly potentially an immune escapee, uh, or at least it may be um, uh, refractory to antibodies induced by the by natural infection or immunity. And so uh, over here on the, on the far uh, side of the table, I've talked about whether the strains are more transmissible, whether they're more virulent, and whether they show evidence of antibody escape. Um, 
almost all of them seem to be more transmissible and some of them are frighteningly more transmissible. And I point out the B117, the UK strain that's emerging and the South African strain, both of which are at least uh, 50 to 70% more transmissible than the viruses we're currently dealing with and not dealing with very well. Um, the, um, there's no evidence that any of them are more virulent, but um, some of them do show preliminary evidence that they may be uh, resistant to some antibodies. But I wanna point out that a vaccine is priming a very complex immune response involving both our B cells and antibody production, but also involving T cells. And so that rich array of, of antibody um, response, it, it does take a, a lot to completely inactivate the vaccine. And happily, and I'm gonna go into the vaccines now for a tiny bit, happily, the vaccines that we have uh, primed uh, to, to, to be uh, shared, I hope soon, I'm, I'm in line first, please. Sorry, no, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wait my turn. But um, are, are really great tools to fighting this virus because they're really adjustable. So I just wanna talk a little bit about uh, the vaccines. So uh, both the Pfizer BioNTech and the Moderna, which are the two vaccines that we have approved in the US and are currently being um, circulated, are messenger RNA vaccines. And what that basically means is that the virus, and I have the picture of the virus particle here with its spike proteins bristling off, and inside is its RNA genome, and a section of that RNA genome encodes for spike, for spike protein. And that little yellow section basically gets inserted into a lipid nano drop, droplet that then gets injected into our arm. And that lipid nano droplet gets incorporated into our cells. And then our cells basically um, use that messenger RNA to produce proteins of the spike protein, which we then present out to our immune system, putting our immune system on alert and then that trains our immune system to both respond to antib with antibody productions that match that spike protein, as well as T cells that match uh, the spike protein. And then these antibodies and, and the T cells remember uh, after they've, they've, um, they've basically been trained by that uh, spike protein to match. And then they're uh, uh, it taken into our immune system memory. And so then when we're re-exposed to a virus, we mount those same matching uh, immune responses. And so the question really is how, um, how much of a mismatch in the spike protein and the immune um, toolkit that we have trained to that spike protein can we accommodate if the naturally circulating strains start to diverge? And um, it turns out quite a lot, although it might depend. And those studies are, are ongoing. But uh, even if um, they the mismatch becomes um, so great that the vaccines are no longer as effective, and right now they're 95% effective, which is great, um, you can go back and very easily adjust the spike protein messenger RNA to be a better match. And so that's the great news about this toolkit. And this is a really new, um, this is an advanced new technology for creating vaccines that makes them very adjustable to a changing virus landscape. So that's the good news. There's another vaccine out that um, is great. Uh, it's uh, approved in the UK. It's 90% effective. It uses a different technology. It uses a, a very mild carrier virus with a bit of the spike protein inserted in its genome as a few more steps to convert genome to uh, uh, protein to present to the immune system, but it's similar in, in many ways. So um, the other thing that's really, really cool is watching how quickly the vaccines have been produced and how they've been evaluated. So um, I mentioned that the first genomes were available on January 10th. By January 11th, people were working on these vaccines and beginning trials to start to study in parallel, both their safety and their efficacy. In the old days, you would first address safety and then efficacy, but now uh, uh, studies are monitoring both together. And so this is a graphic from the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, uh, which originated in Germany. And you can see that uh, there's uh, 43,000 people were vaccinated 
uh, uh, sorry, we're in the study, 21,000 vaccinated, 21,000 given a placebo. And almost all of the cases which are shown in open circles if you're vaccinated or blue circles if you were given a placebo um, are overwhelmingly in the placebo. The colored in uh, circles uh, or, or uh, symbols are severe cases. So and most of the severe cases also were um, in the placebo. So these are based on symptomatic cases. So they're really just measuring um, whether you develop symptoms and exposure to the virus, not whether you can transmit the virus, et cetera. Those are still ongoing studies. Um, and you can see here that um, this is based on a two dose regime. And most of the cases start to diverge after, uh, sorry, the two study groups really start to diverge after that second dose at day 21. So very effective vaccine and very impressive. Okay. I want to make just a little bit of a plug from how I perceive things. I am a microbiologist, a virologist. I study virus evolution at the California Academy of Sciences. And that means that I, uh, as a member of the academy, hold in, in, in high value biodiversity as well as human diversity. And so I've always wanted to, or I've always had a, a trajectory of study that looks at the role of, of biodiversity and nature in determining where emerging infectious diseases come from and then how they play out in human populations. And so using that lens, and, and we've done studies and we have a, a hyp hypothetical model that looks at different kinds of landscapes from forest to urban and, and, and interrogates the, the biodiversity in those landscapes. And, and mostly we've been focused on vector-borne, mosquito-borne diseases. But what's really emerging is an increasing understanding that as we change our relationship with nature in a way that's either exploitative or is um, damaging to, to diversity, we, we may be increasing our risk for an emerging infectious disease event to occur. And so uh, more, uh, many, many people around the world are, are working on this problem. It's, it's not just from my perspective, but uh, the, the, basically the call today in light of the SARS origin from natural systems through possibly kind of an extractive relationship through um, the wildlife trade uh, to, to facilitating the emergence of that uh, virus into humans is really a call to um, to to rally uh, all of our technologies for around early detection, building capacity for better surveillance and response all over the world and communities all over the world, and maybe even starting to think about prevention. How can we reduce our um, change our relationship with nature in a way that would mitigate or or moderate the emerging infectious disease dynamics? And so this is a. This is just the, the model that we're using with, with mosquito-borne viruses, but by no means is this SARS-CoV-2 transmitted by mosquitoes. I just wanna get that right out there. There's no evidence. But basically the, the gray bars show the distribution of biodiversity in different kinds of habitats. And the colored bars are the, are the latent viral diversity or microbial diversity out there. We know there are, the whole world is teeming with viruses. And most of the time, they are they are they're not they do not de ever develop into emerging infectious diseases. And uh, but what what are the drivers that do drive them in, and drive them into becoming an emerging infectious disease? Which is that big red bar on the far right in in modified uh, landscapes where you have a high host density of a single or only a few species we can easily take a variant in a natural system that's relatively rare and see it become hyperdominant and cause epidemics or even pandemics in, in urbanized settings. So working on this, but importantly, uh, there has been a call to take a one health approach to, to be able to understand the cross species barriers that are overcome by this virus. And we know already there are nine um, non-human species that have been infected since the virus emerged from natural systems. And, in, and they're all mammals, but in one case, uh, there was even a, a back transmission event from, a human, uh, from humans to minks. 
<clears throat> and uh, sorry, from minks to humans. So, so uh, this is a really, we really need to take a sort of a holistic natural systems based and one health based approach to um, mitigating future viruses. And I'll just, I just wanna, this is my last slide, but I, but there is um, uh, around the idea of surveillance and capacity building, the NIH uh, funded uh, centers of research in emerging infectious diseases. Um, I'm a partner on, on one of them or a participant in one of them run out of UC Berkeley. And the idea is that we would survey natural systems as well as human systems for a novel viral agents, but build the capacity in country to do that surveillance on site through a very rich program of training and, and other kinds of tool building. So stay tuned, we're very excited. <clears throat> so I just wanna say thank you and uh, take some time to answer any questions and have a discussion about some of the information I presented. Um, I've been collaborating with a group called COVIDnet, which is the hospital-based surveillance system here in California that we derive sequences from. Uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub has been really active uh, as is Christian Anderson at Scripps in, 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 um, in, in and Charles Chu in sequencing viruses and monitoring, especially these uh, new strains and how they might be emerging here in California. So thank you. Any questions? Yes, um, we have lots of questions. Thank you so much, Shannon. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, I hope it's okay. <laughs> no, it was perfect. And we're we're great on time. And we've um I, I think, you know, I just want to acknowledge too that for people watching, you know, as we share all this really in-depth information and data about emerging strains and mutations, it can seem really scary and overwhelming. But I guess I just wanted to make the point that um it's not like this hasn't like this has always happened with viruses, right? It's just that we have we know so much more, which in turn equips us so much better to fight them effectively at scale. And so that data, although overwhelming, is actually a really amazing thing, especially the fact that it's so open source, as you said. Yeah, yes, I uh, thank you. And, and um, I'm so glad you you pulled that, that, uh, that message out of my talk because I think it's really important to know to note that you know we've had we've had Zika, we've had Ebola, we've had many emerging uh, viral events out of a world teeming with viruses, and every time this occurs, we get better and better. So we are now better at completely um, open crowdsourcing uh, high throughput data and and contributing high throughput data to address this problem. When we have new vaccine vaccine technologies that can roll out faster than ever, and new ways of asking whether uh, the virus changes are significant, which is really uh, what, it, what it comes down to. Right, and reacting faster. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. Such, a, such a bright source of hope there. Um, and then I wanted to touch briefly before we get to, to all our really good questions on um, what you were, the, your like kind of last piece when you were talking about natural systems and just in super plain language, are we talking, are we saying that essentially we need to protect natural places and natural systems because that balance is part of what keeps all of us healthy? Is that too reductive or, yeah? No, I, I would say, so, you know, as scientists, we, 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 we erect what, a hypothesis about what, how we think the way the world works. And that would, that would be a perfect way of framing it. My hypothesis and, and many hypotheses are converging on this idea that systems that have many diverse elements in them are, uh, are more resilient to lots of things, whether they're um, an outbreak of, of of pine bark beetle in a forest that's um, that that's a mono demographic stand of one species versus a diverse, rich a species rich forest. Whether it's um, resilience to climate change, and and so the same idea plays out in in our hypotheses, and and many people are actively trying to study this, but um, there's increasing evidence that a, a, a system, a natural system that's um, composed of many different kinds of species from the microbial all the way to the mammalian and everything in between uh, may, it ha has, has a lower incidence of these sort of emerging uh, infectious events that cause great die-offs in the system and can right. negatively impact the system. Okay, yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, all right, I'll dive into these questions. And I wanna say for each per each person that I assigned this question to or credited this question to, we actually got kind of multiple versions of most of these. So um, hopefully this does a good job of spanning lots of people's concerns and um, 
So we'll start with, let's see, let's start with Jessica A, who asks, what should I be doing differently to protect myself and my family from the new, more transmissible strains of COVID? So it's a really great question, and it really gets to the heart of the matter. What should I be doing? So it turns out that if you're, do, if you're following the guidelines, uh, then you're doing everything right. The problem is that the guidelines are often not clear kind of muddy uh, and that people tend to fall off the wagon in terms of complying. But the, if, but if you follow the guidelines and these are you know, wearing a mask and not gathering indoors with people outside your pod and uh, maintaining uh, social distance, six feet or more, uh, those are pretty, those still apply. So this virus, these new strains don't have any sort of new kind of biology like that you know that they can um survive new levels of extremes or or float in in the water you know right. spread through the water system in new ways they're they're still the same biologically as um the 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 preceding strains so uh but but they are if they're if they are more infectious which many of them seem to be more infectious it does mean that if if you don't comply as perfectly, then it takes a, a lot less non-compliance to have a transmission event be successful than before. Right. So I kind of think about it, you know, if I'm sitting in a bar and I take my mask off to have a sip of beer, um, leaving my mask off for seven and a half minutes might have caused an infection to the next person. Now with these new strains, it only take five minutes, okay. for example. So right. that's the, the UK strain is 50% more transmissible, okay. just stickier. So it's mm -hmm. not using ways, but it's uh, using uh, its ways better. Okay. So keep doing all the right things, but just don't fall off the wagon and be as be even more strict about doing them well. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Okay, great. Um, so from Kate J, at the beginning of the pandemic, we heard a lot about how this virus was transmitted. As we've taken to wearing masks to slow the transmission, is there any new evidence of other means of transition besides airborne particles, for instance, touching surfaces? I actually think that um, we have um, honed in on, so the same suite of, of potential transmission routes are still at play, okay. um, droplets, aerosol particles, uh, surfaces, uh, even I think potentially uh, contaminated food might might be the new one that's being watched more assiduously. But I, I think what's really changed is our understanding of the relative importance. And at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody thought that it was mostly large droplets and surface contamination. I think our understanding has changed uh, at, at least to say we cannot discount the potential and very important role of, of aerosolized particles. And um, maybe um, surface-based transmission has kind of slid backwards a little bit in the in the important list okay. of what's relatively important. Okay, but those are all, those are things, those were kind of known and what has changed is not that there's anything new, but just our understanding of the kind of relative efficacy of each of those. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, from Linnea K, after a person receives their full COVID vaccine, should they still wear a mask around others? Could someone who is vaccinated still carry and transmit the virus? So this is a really great question. And I'll just say that the vaccine studies were not designed to look, to, to analyze transmission. So uh, if you're vaccinated, that, that two group I showed you with the Pfizer vaccine, they were not the endpoint of those vaccinated people were not whether they could transmit to other people. The endpoint that was measured was whether they developed symptoms and were classified as a case. So the bottom line is we don't really know for sure. Um, the interesting thing about this virus is that it's, um, and this is not always true of all viruses, but that the, the, the development of symptoms and the ability for a host to transmit are and, and even the ability for a host to get a, a virus, get the get a full uh, infection is dose dependent. And that's why you often hear, you know, the CDC is saying, oh, 15 minutes 
uh, is enough to qualify somebody as having close contact with an infected person. So it, because of the, the longer the, the time you spend in that air plume, the greater the dose you could get. So that suggests that if you do get the vaccine and it's enough to block a development of a symptomatic case of COVID, you may also be blocking developing a fulminant, like a really good uh, uh, case in terms of having enough virus particles in your body. And then by, uh, you know, that suggests that you would not be very good at transmitting either. But those studies are yet to be done. And excitingly, there's there's some studies underway uh, in populations that have been vaccinated to understand uh, the dynamics of transmission in vaccinated populations. Uh, I would still recommend for now, in light of not knowing enough, that we continue to wear our masks and um, practice all of the, um, uh, the social mandates that we've been given because it's, for me, it's very pro-social. We're, we're all in this together. Uh, the pattern of, of vaccination is really unknown and, and you know, you don't know who you're interacting with that may or may not be vaccinated. So uh, I think just being, um, continuing to <laughs> stay the course until we have widespread vaccination and we have data on whether vac vaccines can, can be transmitters, I think we still need to adhere to the, the, to the guidelines. Okay, great. Um, and from John M, uh, how long is someone immune once they're fully vaccinated? Um, and I'll add that this is something a lot of people ask. So many people phrase this as, will this become an annual vaccine like those we get for the flu? Right. Okay. So there's two, there's two embedded questions in there. Um, the reason that we have to get an annual vaccine for flu is not because our, our, our immunity wanes to the vac to the vaccination, uh, but that the match of the vaccination to the dominant strain has drifted. So, so we have to be reinvaccinated because the flu is a moving target. And you know, we just talked about a bunch of new strains, some of which could potentially pose that sort of moving target scenario that we have in flu. So that's on the one side, TBD. But in terms of if if it wasn't a moving target, and and if the vaccine was was pretty, the vaccines were still pretty good matches to the to the strains that are circulating. Uh, would we have immunity? And so immunity is very dynamic and complicated. It's a whole system response. We have B cells producing antibodies. We have T cells. Um, and memory T cells that respond to epitopes, little fragments of the virus all over its genome. And so, um, and, and T cells are known to be long lasting memory, immune memory, and, and B cells, it's still, it really depends. And um, the other complicating factor is if it's a perfect match between the vaccine and the target, then you need a lot less antibody. And so the, 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 um, the impact, the effective, the efficacy lasts longer if the match is really good. And if the match is just eh, eh, then the effect might be, um, might wear off sooner. So you need a higher level of antibody when there's more mismatch to really protect from infection. So this all to say that the good news is that we do think that at least T cell immunity lasts pretty well uh, B cell immunity, uh, it's a very dynamic, depends on what kind of an infection you get. If you get a really uh, severe or a really intense infection that, that goes beyond just your nasopharyngeal passages, you're liable to develop a really good natural immune response. But of course, the vaccine-induced uh, immune response is trying to, to take out that factor and, and just give you a good, with the two dose, a good immune response. So the good news is that it's that at least for some elements, it um, it'll, it's probably pretty long lasting if the target doesn't move. If the target moves and it, it does, it's not evolving as fast as flu, so it probably wouldn't have to be an annual revaccination. But um, <clears throat> if the target does move at some other time scale beyond one year, for sure, uh, we do at least have a vaccine toolkit to make those adjustments much more readily than flu. Flu, the flu vaccine um, development and pipeline is much more cumbersome than the technology we are using with the mRNA vaccines. So that's good news. Okay, great. 
And, you know, I just want to note too, like, I so appreciate how you're, you're so careful and intentional about how you're answering these things. And I know it's so difficult because you're, it's an emerging body of knowledge. You're trying, you're clearly trying to be so um, kind of dedicated to just being as accurate as possible and mapping out all these different things. And again, this is like a really complex thing we're talking about. So I think, um, like, I appreciate that the care you take with them, but it's also, uh, you, you know, I think it's for people who just want easy yes, no answers, this is a really challenging time because that's not what we have right now. And that's not what works yeah. actually for this field. Yeah. Right. And and I think it's really, I mean, as a scientist, uh, sometimes scientists, when you're, when you're learning science, you're, you know, you're given a textbook and it feels like everything is known. Right. But in fact, science is really about owning uncertainty, measuring uncertainty, and then using that uncertainty to be strategic about the kinds of studies and the kind of information you need to resolve the uncertainty. So it's right. a process. And it's a right. really fun one. If anybody's on the fence about becoming a scientist, <laughs> I'd push it over. Now's the time. Give them a boot. Yeah. Um, Okay, great. So this question is from Donna R. and others. Um, is there any evidence to suggest that certain people or certain blood types are less susceptible to being infected? Ha, huh, I don't, I actually, it's funny because I just came across a paper and I didn't have time to read it last night that was taking a dive in on that and about really looking at the underlying um, human uh, genetic signatures that, that could be uh, perhaps driving health disparities in response to SARS-CoV-2. So I would say stay tuned. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an emerging area of inquiry, and uh, but I don't know the answer. Okay, and it's a sign of how fast stuff is happening <laughs> coming out that yeah. you just, yeah. Uh, amazingly fast. And I will just say, unlike um, the old days when I, in my, as a scientist in my youth, you would, there would be months and months and months between when you gathered data and finally published data in through the peer reviewed process. Mm -hmm. But there's been hundreds of thousands of papers deposited in preprint archives that are publicly available for all of us as a scientific community and everybody to review and dive into. They haven't been formally peer reviewed, but it's an amazing amount of information that still has to be sorted through, but is, is, is basically available to to evaluate. Okay, great. And we had several questions about resources, so I'll just work with you later to, to maybe provide some good kind of clearinghouse for things. Yeah. Um, I'll move to this question from Kelson Y, who says, in terms of overall benefits to society, do you think it's better for more people to get a single dose of the vaccine or for fewer people to get both intended doses? Um, you know, this is a great question, and but I will I will just say that the the vaccines that are currently approved have have not been evaluated in terms of uh, a, a plan around a single dose. They really, really, really work best with a double dose. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm you know I I'm concerned already about our our si social lack of trust in in vaccines in general that I, I would hate to um, misapply a vaccine in a way that it wasn't fully uh, described, characterized and studied because I really think it would erode our, our trust in vaccines even further. So, uh, and I, but I do, you know, I do, I, I understand that, you know, some, some places are wrestling with that. There are mathematical modelers that are actually taking a mathematical approach to studying that. So if a single dose of a vaccine protects you with a 52% efficacy and the double dose is 95%, these are the Pfizer numbers. Um, what, you know, can we play around with the numbers and the, the demographics of who's vaccinated to, um, to, to, to see whether it really does reduce transmission overall to take a one dose impact. But, um, here in California, I, I think the jury's still out on what the barrier is. And I, I don't know if it's necessarily that we have a supply chain problem or a, I would say a supply problem. Maybe the operational, um, the, 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 the operational infrastructure to distribute the vaccine and um, process people and uh, maybe some demand problems, but I don't think we have enough um, evidence that the doses in hand are the main barrier. 
And so I don't, I wouldn't support a single dose approach till I see the mathematical models and have that be the main barrier identified. Right. Okay, great. Um, this question is from another Shannon, Shannon A. Um, and she writes, or they write, I recently read that the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia found evidence of blood vessel damage in kids who'd been infected with COVID, even if they didn't show symptoms. Do we know anything new about how this virus impacts children? So I actually haven't stayed up a lot on the literature about the clinical aspects of this virus, but um, over the you know, over the course of this uh, of this epidemic and, and hearing from uh, all the, you know, the different uh, clinical colleagues, uh, I would say the take home message here is that there is so much we don't know. And right. and with a new virus like this, we, we really need to take a precautionary principle. So, uh, I, you know, I've heard from young people, ah, I'm, I'll only get a mild case and then I'll kick it and that'll be fine. We don't really know that people won't have um, long-term um, collateral tissue damage um, in, the, in the full presence of the virus, collateral kinds of damage. We don't understand the immune system's response and the virus's response to an infection fully as well as we should to take the risk of thinking that children are, are gonna be okay. We, we just don't have enough information. Right. And, I, and I would say for, for young adults, for anybody, um, just like how, how shocked we were that shingles was the sequelae of chickenpox. Like, right. we didn't know that. I mean, how may, who knows what kind of sequelae this virus might have, either um, from direct virus sort of resurging, being present. Uh, there's these syndromes called, called long COVID. Uh, that we still don't know. Um, we don't know what's going on. So I, I would say there's so much we don't know. Don't take the risk to have um, uh, children and young adults be exposed to this virus. Okay, great. Really important point. Um, this one's from, uh, tell me if you need a long drink of water and I'll talk about, I'll opine for coffee. a while. If you <laughs> okay. Um, so this question is from Tracy L. And she writes, in California, we've heard recently about a batch of vaccines that cause some allergic reactions, but I don't understand why one batch would do that and what the allergen in question is. Can you explain? Uh, so I actually just recently read a release from the California Department of Public Health that they're, um, they're, they've formally evaluated the data and that there is not a problem with this with this batch. So people have got the green light to go forward. And I really, I do trust that evaluation. Um, I, there, there is a, there is a, a, I will add to the resources that I work on with Laurel, but there is a list of uh, additives in, in this vaccine. And, you know, all vaccines have, have a bit of this and a bit of that to, 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 to do certain, certain things. Um, but, but, you know, just like any, you know, you pick up anything and you have the active ingredient and then you have a few additives. So um, there's a full list available that of what this, of these vaccines and what they have, and none of them ring alarm bells okay. uh, for being particularly allergenic. And so um, I, I think most of the, um, most of the, of the, of the, you know, reports that we have of, of adverse reactions are certainly serious and for the person that has them, but at a population level, they're really, really rare. They're still rare. So these vaccines are have no more adverse reactions than very well approved um, uh, vaccines that are that are out there. And so there's they really are um, generally very, very safe. Okay. Great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'll do about five more if that sounds manageable. Sure. Um, yep. Let's do. So from Andrew C, um, I needed a COVID test recently and there were multiple different options and I didn't know which one to book. Um, what, what tests are out there now and how are they different? And this is actually a question we got from a lot of people because testing is starting to become such a kind of normal part of a lot of people's lives and they find they need a routine test for travel or they're actually really worried and need an immediate answer. So I think this will be helpful for a lot of folks. Right, and this is another thing that I will um, add to our resource list, Lauren, oh, right. to uh, keep me on it. But but basically there are two, 
you know, main testing approaches. And the, the one testing approach um, that's the main one is, a, is a, an approach that de detects the virus directly. And they either use it, um, they, they, the approach is either to detect the actual genetic um, makeup, the genetic footprint or signature of the virus, so capturing its genome, and then the other kinds of tests are around detecting the proteins that the virus produces to make its way in the world. And, and, and so that's the direct detection of virus. And most of the tests that are out there are, are those ones. Um, the, uh, the other kind of test, which would be very useful, is an antibody test, which is not testing for virus directly, but it's testing for whether you have antibodies to, a, to the virus indicating that you had it in the past. Those are still being uh, seriously evaluated and um, those I would say have made a fewer advances because it's really messy because our antibodies um, seem to cross react with the common cold, the human coronaviruses that cause common cold. So it's, it's, it's still TBD. Some are, some are being rolled out with, with different levels of sensitivity and specificity. So those are the two things we always ask is, how specific is the test? So is it going to um, accidentally pick up human coronavirus, the common cold forms, uh, or is it really uh, specific to SARS-CoV-2? And then sensitivity. And that means what, what level of a virus in your body do you need to be able to um, be uh, recorded as positive? according to the test. So you want a test that's very specific and very sensitive. I don't know how many people I talked to over Thanksgiving or Christmas that said, well, I'm going to go get a negative test. I'm going to go get a test. If it's negative, I'm going to go visit my family. But, but, but really, if you get that, if, if you get that test on day X, you're just, you, you may still have virus in your body. It just might not have replicated to a high enough level for it to be detectable by said test. So yeah. The sensitivity of the test is really important, and there are plenty of what we call false negatives, where the test reports um, no indication, but uh, but that you do have virus levels. So, the direct detection of the virus through genetic information, and we call that th these are basically PCR-like tests, mm -hmm. polymerase chain reaction tests. Those are very specific, very specific. They're not going to accidentally pick up anything else, and they're pretty sensitive but they do take a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. um, the other kinds of tests out there that detect the protein of the virus are also pretty specific and they're pretty sensitive and they're faster, maybe not quite as sensitive as a PCR test. Um, and uh, uh, one of the rapid tests that are out there that are um, that is rated pretty high, although I've ha heard some rumors that some rapid tests are now giving false positives, don't know how that's happening. Um, is the Abbott, uh, the Abbott's rabbit or rapid test. But if you go to your healthcare, your, your standard clinic, you will most undoubtedly get a PCR based test. And there are many different sort of proprietary approaches to the kinds of uh, enzymes they use to amplify the genetic signal of the virus, but uh, they're both, they're basically good. They just take a while, a okay. day, two days. Okay. And, and if you're in a hurry, I'm a big fan of the Abbott's rabbit test. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. What's the one where they don't use the foot long swabs that go into your brain? Is there uh, I know. <laughs> I know. That was terrible. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to back up and ask this one from YouTube user, Mr. Everything Think is Taken, who um, has a great question we haven't asked before. Mm -hmm. And they preface it by saying, this may be silly, but um, why do viruses actually exist? Like, what is the purpose of a virus? <laughs> It, 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 okay. Well, first of all, what's the purpose of a human, right? right. <laughs> like we really like, yeah. um, there's no such thing as a silly question. I love this question. Um, but, but if we, if, if we, um, you know, take off our Buddha hat and start to evaluate the, the purpose, uh, I'm, I'm assuming to humans or, or, you know, the, the human centric, um, nature of that question, like what, what are the purposes of things? Mm -hmm. Um, then, then uh, that's fair. So, uh, so viruses. So viruses are basically um, cassettes of genetic information that are codependent 
uh, they evolve, but they cannot really um, make their way in the world. They're obligate um, cellular parasites. So they need to live inside a cell. And some of them integrate into the genomes of cells directly, and some just kind of ex exist in the gel, in the cell's jelly, the cytoplasm, and they make their, their, they have their whole life in the cytoplasm. But regardless, because the genetics are, uh, because the viruses are like these little genetic themes um, that can can move between cells, uh, and often different kinds of cells, they are really important for shuffling up the genetic um, uh, toolkits that that various cells can have. And you might say, uh, well, give me an example. Uh, so, you know, viruses have been parasitizing cellular life since cellular life evolved. And, and it's a chicken and egg question. We don't know really which came first, but um, there are uh, thematic elements in the placenta of mammals that look similar to um, the virus uh, genes that encode for different um, uh, layers of their own capsules. And, and so, you know, maybe early on in the evolution of cellular life, we, we shared capacity between cells via virus infection for developing really great membranes. Yeah. Just, yeah. You know, one example. Um, viruses in, in an ecological context, uh, we complain about the viruses that infect us, but there's a whole group of viruses that specialize on infecting bacteria. And they're called phage, they're a kind of virus, and they actually massively regulate um, bacteria. And so if you have a skew in your gut microbiome and some, say some Escherichia coli becomes hyperdominant, um, you could be assured that at some point phage viruses will beat that variant down and and um, and, and possibly um, even out the microbiome in your gut. So we're teeming with with bacteria. We are teeming with viruses of those bacteria, and then of course we're teeming with our own viruses. So not all viruses are bad. Um, viruses uh, deserve to live as much as anybody. <laughs> Maybe we should start a rehabilitation yeah. campaign for, for good virus or viruses that are good in yeah. the human centric view. Right. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I'll hit you with two more. Um, this one is from, and of course, I'm going to end with like big, broad, sweeping ones that are not fair for someone who's been talking for an hour. No but, problem. Um, from Greg K, in your opinion, how long do you think we'll all be wearing masks? Is there a scenario in which this actually all goes away? Okay, so I'm really kicking myself because, uh, first of all, I'm Canadian and I'm kind of a positive person. And I like <laughs> cup half full to my approach in the world. And back in March, if you, if I don't know if I said this in my Breakfast Club, but I was thinking this and I said it lots over, uh, you know, to different friends and colleagues. Ah, this is gonna roll the way it rolled in China. You know, China basically, you know, hit. Get, you know, got a lot of virus, but basically bent the curve within a few months and, and they were had it all cleaned up by March, April, March maybe. And so when we were really going through here in California, our surge in March, I was telling my academy colleagues, ah, we're gonna be done. We'll be done in May, Memorial Day opening. But, um, and so I've been burned by my over overly positive attitude. And so I will, tr I'm trying to not be Debbie Downer, but also be a little bit more realistic. And here's what I'm thinking now. Um, we never did have the commitment and the clarity to adhere to some of the necessary protections, like really rigorous, good mask wearing right. and other, uh, social mandates. We weren't good at that before. And now we have a bunch of virus strains emerging that are more transmissible than the ones that we were already not so good at before, of managing before. And so I think that we're in a race. We're basically in a race. And the, and the length of having to keep wearing masks is going to depend on we now have the only hope now is really the the vaccines. And so we're basically in a race and uh, to to uh, between how fast the new, more transmissible variants take over. And the B117 is predicted to take over in the US in about two months, uh, or at least in California. Um, 
and how many people can get vaccinated and how, uh, and if people can get vaccinated before the virus variant swarm becomes um, enough of a poor match that the vaccine isn't as good anymore. So we, we really need to deploy the vaccine, take the vaccine and um, do it fast. That, and, then, and then that I think will uh, indicate an, an end to mask wearing if the results indicate that the vaccines prevent transmission right. the same way that they prevent disease. Right, right. And this is, I think, particularly salient, salient today because just this morning there were a bunch of stories that I sort of heard and saw about how um, cases in the U.S. had peaked. And so I think that could give people kind of this false sense of security, like, oh, we're on the way down. But as you say, it really is with these emerging strains a race at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So summing up everything that you've said in the last hour to respond to this final question from Gabby H., um, she basically wants your help. What would you say to friends and relatives who think it's just too risky to get the vaccine or people who are worried about long-term effects? I would get the vaccine in a heartbeat. I have not uh, run into any uh, anybody that um, is in this field that that really looks into the 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 um, the way the vaccine works, the both of the mRNA vaccines, and um, that that wouldn't. So, in my field, in my area, the my the most trusted uh, people in my circles would take the vaccine without hesitancy. So um, I would say uh, to, to people that, um, that getting the vaccine and any, any slight potential risk, say to having an allergic reaction or an, another adverse side effect is so much less than getting the virus. The virus itself is is worse. It's worse because um, it kills people. It, and even if it doesn't kill you directly, you become an active transmitter to people that will die. Um, and even if you get a, a what ostensibly looks like a mild infection, we have no idea how, um, how impactful that might be to people's long-term health. Mm -hmm. And so why would you gamble with so much unknown when you could take uh, something whose risk profile is very well known and very, very tiny. Yeah. Right, for your sake and everyone else's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That was considering that I've been pumping you information <laughs> for information since 10 o'clock, a really extraordinary wrap up. And I honestly, I can't thank you enough for coming back and spending this time with us. There are people already in comments saying that they feel better um even if they don't a thousand percent understand everything we've spoken about today there is just the sense that like yes these things are being studied and they are understood to a degree where we can now move forward um in a way that actually allows us to move forward i think for the first time in a while um good you're so, welcome you're yeah. really welcome it's my pleasure to come back and i do i do think it's really important we can move forward we have a plan we need to stay the course in terms of all of these so frustrating um social and mask wearing mandates and get the vaccine the minute you can yeah okay great thank you and we will and shannon and i will talk offline and we will follow up by throwing some resources in the um comment fields of both platforms um and then I will just say in closing too, if you would like more science, um, please come back tonight at 7 p.m. Night School will be covering moths and butterflies. So that's kind of a visual treat and a change of a uh, lighter change of topic. Um, and then on Tuesday here on Breakfast Club, we're gonna be talking about California wildfires with UC Berkeley's Kendall Lee Calhoun. But um, looping back to this, Shannon, again, thank you. This is central to everybody's lives right now. So there really could not have been a, um, a better thing to talk about today, especially if so many people are are about to or already have received uh, first doses. So thank you. You're so welcome. And I'm happy to come back anytime. Thank you for having me back. We'll hold you to that. And <laughs> viewers, if you um, would like to help support the Academy and in sports science, we are reeling from many, many months of closure. 
And if you are able to give anything at all, there is a link to donate to our relief fund um, on YouTube and on the Facebook button. Um, but if not, please just keep watching our programs and engaging us. We're so grateful to uh, have you in our digital family. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Be safe.